and we're live on YouTube. Great, welcome everyone uh, to another council meeting in virtual times. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, Councillor Doreen O'Sullivan has been hard at work vaccinating folks and I think our North Granville Municipal Center, uh, Councillor Sullivan, is that right? You were at the Municipal Center today? Yeah. Okay, so uh, as uh, some of you may know, I know uh, Councillor O'Sullivan on behalf of Leeds Granville Atlantic Public Health would like to celebrate the fact that we have the highest vaccination rate in uh, the province. Uh, what's the percentage, Councillor O'Sullivan? Uh, it's over 80% for uh, first vaccines and 70% for second vaccines. Amazing. That is really, really amazing. Eligible. Yeah, very good. And I, I know people have questions about um, when they can do walk-ins at the vaccination center here in North Granville. Is the vaccination center open all week here in North Granville? No, the next clinic in Kempville is on Thursday. Okay. And uh, it's open for walk-ins. And mm -hmm. we're actually canceling clinics as of September because we've hit the saturation or we will at that point. So anybody who has an appointment in September or October is going to be called and asked to move ahead, but you can proactively make the call and move your appointment up. You can come for a walk-in. Um, Today we had Pfizer and Moderna and going forward, I think people will now be given the choice because we have a very good supply and we've reached that level. So, so everything's going very well. I'm working myself out of a job <laughs> and that's good. Well, certainly thank you. Uh, thank you for your service. And that's a, a great way to start our meeting with a public health <laughs> notice. I know lots of people are asking questions about when they can get that second vaccine or if they've uh, been hesitant to get vaccinated up to now, uh, certainly there's lots of vaccines available. Yeah. And certainly I think the Leeds Granville Lanark uh, Public Health Unit Facebook page uh, and some of the phone numbers have all the information. But thank you for your service and thanks to everyone on the call or the meeting tonight who uh, patiently waited, us for, uh, waited for us to begin. Well, thank you uh, so much. There's another clinic too on Sunday. Okay. So Thursday and Sunday here in North Granville and walk-ins are uh, available as I. Yes. Perfect. Beautiful. Thank you, uh, Council Sullivan. Okay, so uh, we quickly met and closed uh, previous to this. Uh, I believe we uh, adopted the agenda at that time. Ms. Backrock Cormier, can you confirm? That's correct, Your Worship. Great. So then with that in mind, I, I know we reviewed the agenda, but we had, I wasn't sure if we had gone through the formalities. We've come out of closed. Um, I'll look for disclosures of interest. Uh, colleagues, you've had a chance to look at the agenda. Uh, do I have any disclosures of interest this evening when it comes to perceived or real financial benefit or loss arising from anything on the agenda? Seeing none, I will move on then. And it's our great pleasure to welcome um, a delegation this evening, uh, Burkett Foster, Peter Linton, and Chris Rancoulers. Chris, please, you'll have to pronounce your own name. Thank you. Um, that was uh, very good. That was oh, very, very good. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so obviously, um, North Granville, um, in fact, commissioned this uh, broadband study to look very specifically at the needs uh, here within the community. Uh, we've been a big part of the Eastern Ontario Regional Network's uh, call for a, a gigabyte to every home and commercial property uh, throughout uh, Leeds and Grenville and, and uh, Eastern Ontario. At the same time, as has been said many times, it became obvious to us that we had to take a closer look at how uh, residents and businesses within our own community were being served, uh, what the service levels were like, where there were opportunities for improvement regardless of uh, kind of the, the bigger landscape. Um, and with that in mind, uh, I'm not sure if uh, Ms. Janu is uh, wanting to say anything before we get to the study. We know that um, the delegation this evening also came to our CDAC committee, the Community and Economic Development Advisory Committee, and we had some good discussion there. And we felt it was important to bring it to the attention of the community and, and to my council colleagues, because there are some short and midterm implications that I know the municipality is already advancing and that uh, we will have to consider um, moving forward, both from a budget perspective and from a strategic advocacy perspective, if you will. So I'm thrilled uh, we're able to deal with this tonight. Ms. Janu, were you planning to say anything? 
Um, I'll follow up after the presentation with okay. my report, but happy to pass it on to Burkett and team. Okay. Uh, so with that in mind, I'll invite Burkett to uh, get started. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, for inviting us to come back and give a presentation on this. Um, and thank you for all the cooperation we've had from from the group. Um, it's been it's been uh, interesting, um, partly because we hadn't even really deeply looked at um, North Grenville for a while ourselves at, at Storm. Um, and uh, and one of the biggest things that's going to be a difference over time is the fact that that um, new technologies have arrived in, and in fact, one of the new technologies was just licensed as early as April this year. So it, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through. So we did a broadband study. We started, oh, I don't know, Hillary, we started the process in May, April? Yeah, very beginning of May. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so, so we, we did the broadband study. The idea was to find out where the deficits were, um, to take a look at, uh, um, where the supply was, therefore, what's the gap, and then make some suggestions on, on how you might solve some of the problems as a municipality. Um, we took a look at a, a lot of different solutions that people have done around North America um, for solving this exact problem when they're in rural areas to try and bring the rural area up to the level that urban areas have to try and solve the digital divide and give people um, ubiquitous access um, with, with good solid internet. So next slide, please. Um, so uh, there, there is a lot of, a lot of things that, that uh, we saw in, in this. There is certainly high demand, um, uh, especially uh, exasperated by the um, issues that came up because of the pandemic. And we've had uh, um, to focus on, on what kind of things that people need. And so now with sometimes people having three children at home plus um, uh, the, the parents working, um, both parents working, uh, there'd be five internet connections all using Zoom calls at the same time. And many of the infrastructures weren't up to that kind of call. So um, there, there was uh, a lot of dissatisfaction with the current levels of service. Um, moving on to the next slide, please. Um, so we, we looked at the map for wh what it takes to uh, um, get broadband in the North uh, Granville area. And you'll notice that uh, we have um, uh, green in the, in the big urban area of Kenthal and lots of uh, purple outside that area. And the purple is the, uh, the five down, one up uh, DSL for the most part, and sometimes wireless five down and, and one up. Um, and, and so these are, these are um, uh, what's available in your neighborhood today. And there's quite a bit of um, purple and blue on this map. And, and we'd like to, um, as we went through, we started looking at ways that some of those things could get solved. Moving on to the next slide. Um, so we looked at where everybody came from that, that, that participated. So you had 264 of your households participated. Um, so it's, it's about 4% of all your households. So it's statistically valid. Uh, um, you know, Kempville had a lot of them. Uh, and, and so this is what we had for, for people who participated in the survey. And moving on to the next slide, please. Um, three quarters of the folks work from home. And that's not surprising because there's a pandemic on while we were doing this. Um, and uh, the majority are either moderate or heavy internet users. And, and so, um, uh, because you have students engaged in long time in, on online learning nowadays, the primary source of television, um, more you've crossed the halfway mark for um, people using the internet to get that that television feed, um, and uh, the, and also of course movies, which between Netflix and and all the rest of the other uh, you know Prime, Amazon Prime and all the rest of the other suppliers, there's lots of stuff going on for movies. Um, interestingly enough, Kempfel is a gaming center with 37% having a heavy gamer at home. Uh, gaming tends to uh, require really good internet connections so that people don't lose their spaceship or, or their, uh, their first person shooter game person. Um, Avatar, that's the name of it. 
Um, so those are kinds of things. And it's interesting because um, in our discussions with some, some people uh, around this, people didn't realize that if you have um, uh, a Siri or Alexa or one of the you know, Google Home uh, devices and you talk to it, um, it's using Wi-Fi along with the six telephones that you have in your house or, or smartphones you have in your house, along with the smart lighting you have, along with the laptop you're actually trying to work from. Um, so, and each of your four smart TVs are trying, trying to find Wi-Fi all the time. So that's one of the things that, that some people didn't realize as we talked to them about it. Next slide, please. Um, so the average cost is about 125 a month. Uh, and the average business internet was, was um, uh, 21 meg megabits per second. And part of that is depending on where the person was located. So if, if you're not trying to do things in beautiful downtown Campville, but actually, you know, trying to do things from say Oxford station, you're going to get less internet there than you, than you would in the main urban area. So that, that was just the way it was. We only had 14 organizations, despite the work um, from the municipality and from the chamber of commerce to reach out to local businesses, only 14 people came forward and responded from a, from a commercial side. Um, so, so we don't probably have a, a, a really true picture of what's going on. Um, but I know that there's a lot of people also working from home in the area. So that's, that's important as well. Moving on. Um, so then we looked at the, uh, uh, at, at the gap. So there's different kinds of internet. So there's fixed wireless, which basically goes from a, a tower to, to a home. Um, and there's LTE, which stands for long-term evolution. Um, and, and that's a, a, a form of wireless internet. Um, and then there's some limited DSL access. Um, uh, we, we know that there's um, fiber to the neighborhood coming to certain urban areas. Um, and we also know that uh, um, now with fixed wireless, um, back when we worked on, um, on the EORN project to deliver to Campville, um, I think that, that there was, uh, um, Chris, was it uh, 10 one? Was that what we were putting in and then back in 2015 when we were doing the EORN project? Yeah, EORN man mandated a, a 10 one um, yeah. speed at, at that time. Yeah. That wasn't so that long ago. That was 2015, so only six years ago, but you know, I think it was anyway. So that just bumps it up nowadays we can do five times that speed so you can get 50 10 or 25 10 um you know 25 5 um, you know both of those kinds of things are available now which weren't before so that could change change uh what gets uh served in the area um and uh the the the, the really interesting thing was somebody actually hit the nail on the head which is from the municipality's point of view, the availability, price, and reliability should be the same all over Grenville County. I would actually go a step further and say should be the same all over Eastern Ontario, and that's part of what EORN is uh, working on to try and get that delivered with the gig project. Moving on to the next slide. Um, so uh, there are two areas that you can look at. One is focus on investment. So um, the people from the Rural Ontario Municipal Association or ROMA um, have actually looked at this and how it works. Um, and they've made some suggestions in some of their uh, letters for things that you can do to, to help attract investment because um, high-speed internet doesn't come to your community for free. Uh, it requires money to, to connect with people. And based on the SWIFT project, which is Southwestern Ontario's internet um, project, uh, it looks like it's a between uh, about 3,500 and 10,000 per household to fiber them. Um, so depending on the distance between the household. Uh, and, and so you need to be looking at how do I attract the investment and can I get investment from, from uh, the government to help some of that out, that, that does. So we think in the short run, um, looking at partnering opportunities, perhaps, uh, upgrading your existing technologies in your area. So, uh, whenever somebody wants to apply to get, uh, to get some funding to help you, it's useful for you to look at whether you can provide a letter of support for them. And, um, and also helping the community know 
um, that, that there's things going on. So we've had, as an example, we've had people from various areas open a Facebook group um, specifically uh, to get internet for that community. We've seen that on a number of occasions and the community champion goes around and helps things happen. Um, and, and so then the communications on those kinds of developments need to get out there. Um, uh, you know, Bell basically starts at 5,000 people in, in a group in order for them to be interested. A lot of, the, you know, us and Joe Computing and, and ExplorerNet and, and others um, will come for something less. Um, Eastern Ontario Regional Network is something that we think uh, has good ideas for delivering this. Um, anytime you're building a road, we'd, we'd love to see you put a four inch conduit in the municipal roadway because that makes it easier. You can, we'll rent that conduit from you if we use it. Um, and if you want to get internet everywhere, if you're digging up a whole stretch of road, please put a conduit in, make it easy. Every time you do a road crossing, put a four inch conduit in right beside, beside the culvert um, because that just makes it much easier for, for us to cross roads. Um, and where possible, provide access to municipal property, sometimes to, as a place to build a tower, and sometimes a vertical asset like a water tower itself could be used. Um, and we've been talking um, with Hillary about establishing uh, MAA standards. So municipal access agreements allow us to put um, uh, fiber down a ditch and, and uh, be able to connect, connect customers. Um, there's also MAA standards. Sometimes if you own your own telephone poles or hydro poles, the municipalities do, do own them in some cases. Um, it's useful to have standards around those as well. And next slide, please. Um, there are partnership opportunities that, that there's good examples of. So Leeds um, and Thousand Islands has gone forward to do 100% fiber to the premises coverage. They did a very good study to put that together. Um, the estimate for what they have to raise to be able to make this happen is over 3 million bucks. So it's, it's kind of important for you to understand that you know, none of this is going to be handed to you on a silver platter, but there are ways of doing this. There, um, I looked at what Barry's been doing. Barry actually has done something where they raise some money, um, and I'm not sure exactly the borrowing mechanism they use to do that, but they raised some money, but they took a lien against the houses that were getting access to the, to the, um, the local initiative, um, local improvement initiative. So they actually took a lien against those houses, and if those houses sell, um, the, the money gets satisfied immediately. And if not, it gets taken off your tax bill. Um, and it, let's say it was a $4,000 to connect your house, it would be a $400 a year for 10 years, plus some interest built into that. And th that means that you can actually have a way of funding it and yet still have security against, against the project. Anyway, th their, their objective here was, was to get uh, um, a municipally owned and then people could, could uh, could work on work across that network. Next slide, please. Um, another opportunity was the town, the township of Romera. They focused only on six areas that they discovered in their their neighborhood that were underserved. And so, because they were underserved, they just worked on those. And their estimated investment was around a million bucks to be able to do that. And and that was their RF, RFP um, back in April. Um, and uh, next slide. Um, so there's an example out of, out of, uh, Pictou County, which is in, in, uh, the Halifax, uh, outside Halifax, and they've done a public private partnership. Um, they've encouraged local ISPs and local businesses and economic development to work together and collaborate to, to, uh, divide up how they're going to deliver this high speed internet, because they know that, um, a rising internet raises all ships. And, uh, so that's an important piece of what their strategy was. And the municipal, municipality led this, and uh, it allowed them to have revenue sharing across um, uh, with w across the uh, whole network, um, and so they got something back for their investment in doing that. So those are some examples. And next slide. Um, so Peter Leeton and myself are happy to have participated in this. We had a lot of good cooperation from Hillary. And, uh, and the staff in, in, uh, um, in North Grenville, and we thank you for the opportunity. Um, Hillary, do you want to do questions now or yep. at another time? Yep, no, we can uh, do questions now. I mean, this is an opportunity. I know 
Um, Deputy Mayor and I had a had the benefit of this presentation at CDAC, but it was important that it come to council and to the community um, in a larger sense. So I'll uh, look to colleagues. I think we can take the presentation down, um, but I'll look to colleagues for, for any questions. I, I have an update on EORN, but before I do that, I'm wondering if anyone has any questions. I know we have council members who are well served by internet and who are less served by internet. Does anything come up for you? Uh, Councillor O'Sullivan and Councillor Barkley, please. Thank you. I, I was just wondering if the survey was done all online or were there hard copies available and were, were the hard copies readily available? Was the survey done during a lockdown when the library and the municipal centre were closed? Because if people have issues with internet, then they certainly would have had issues responding uh, online. It was all online, so Councillor Sullivan, that 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 is that is correct. It was all online. It was open for we kept it open an extra week um, at the end of the day uh, in order to make to try and encourage more more um, people to participate. It got advertised in the local Facebook groups, and I know both the Chamber of Commerce and the um, uh, and Matt Gilmer from from your Economic Development Office uh, um, reached out to businesses to try to get them involved as well. Okay, thank you. Because that, that may certainly have uh, have had an impact on, on the responses if they were online and people had poor internet. Yes, and I, I have another agree. question actually, when you mentioned um, the, the, uh, the plan to lay a four inch conduit when there's any major road construction done. And that, so my question is for public works to see if maybe director Dunlop would know, was there or um, a conduit buried at the time when they did Wellington road and currently right now it's, it's dug up crossing bridge street onto Parkinson street. So I'm just wondering, was that done? Has that something that we're, we're, uh, getting proactive about doing that. Karen? Um, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, no, that was not. Uh, the water and sewer lines were the main uh, thought process in regards to Wellington. I can see what the status of the project is to see if it, it can be included, but uh, fiber to the home uh, within the urban area is something that has been a priority of uh, some service providers over the last few years. So I can connect with uh, the group tomorrow to see if uh, where we are on the construction project, where we can go from here. Okay, thank, thank you very much. I understand that there is fiber line buried between Wellington Road and the rail trail so along that stretch i don't know exactly how far it goes I, I think i've seen some of the the posts further down the rail trail towards county road 44 so i'm not sure how far it goes but uh, anyway i don't know if that's buried in a conduit or if that could be used in the future sorry karen i'm kind of not a problem <laughs> It's sort of hard to see all these faces here and look the right way. Anyway, um, so I, I don't know if that's something that maybe Public Works would put on the radar going forward to know that when any infrastructure is done that we proactively put that in place, so. Um, through you, Your Worship, I can answer the first question in regards to the fiber optic lines that are within the rail trail. Uh, they do run quite a, quite a ways because they run between uh, Montreal and Toronto. So <laughs> they are multiple uh, um, sets uh, or cables of fiber, uh, as well as two different providers. So they are long distance lines. Um, uh, but as I said, uh, we can look into Wellington Road and any projects in the future when we're doing underground infrastructure, linear work. Okay. Are they in a conduit then? What's under, what's along Wellington Road? Uh, uh, the ones that are along the rail trail. Um, some are, some are not. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm learning more stuff every day. Okay, great. Um, I will go then to... Um, uh, Council Barkley, I just a quick follow up, uh, Ms. Dunlop. I know you and I spoke briefly about plans for County Road 43. 
I know um, certainly at the United Counties, there's a new CEO who is thinking about uh, internet and EV charging stations. So I'm assuming you've had some success in terms of anticipating, uh, you know, creating the opportunity to run uh, cables underneath if required. Is there a quick status update on that? Um, uh, through uh, you again, Your Worship, in regards to County Road 43, there are some utility relocations that will be uh, undertaken later this year. We have asked the County Road 43 designer to make sure that they include an extra set uh, of ducts and to make sure they reached out. Uh, we have had a couple people come up uh, to the plate and we're looking for a space. Um, so absolutely, uh, now is the time to, uh, to get that done. Great, thanks. Okay, um, Councilor Barkley. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this question would be for either Burkett, or I guess either and Burkett and Hillary, uh, regarding the pick two uh, example that you gave where there was a revenue sharing model. Uh, I just wondered if either one of you had more details, uh, whether that's different technology or whether it's just a, a financial model of, of getting these things uh, up and running. Uh, using uh, a partnership with a private company. Burkett, uh, are you familiar with this project in Pictou, Nova Scotia? Um, to, to some degree, it, and, the, and the project is um, deliberately done as a financial model to make sure that the uh, municipality gets its money back over time, um, and also to make an investment in the community so that, so that they can get better internet overall, because without being a public-private partnership, it just wasn't going to be made. Uh, Hillary, do you have, I, were you able to speak to that representative of the company? Yes. I, I don't know if it's the same company that was involved with Picto or not. Yeah, so I talked to some folks in Picto uh, a couple weeks ago now, um, and I got to talk to someone at the municipality as well as someone kind of on, it was a partnership. So we had one uh, coalition that was working on the financial side of things and one that was working on the management, you know, technology side of things. So I got to talk to both. So it was really interesting. Um and no, it wasn't any kind of new technology. It was any of the things that Burkett and team have talked about and discussed in the study. Um, it really was the only thing different that you don't see in most municipalities was the financial model. Sorry. Oh, you're muted. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so what were the advantages basically going, were they able to roll it out faster than, you know, uh, seeking for upper level funding or... Uh, did you get into that at all? Like I'm, I'm interested in the pros and cons of using that way of, you know, wiring the rest of the community. Yeah, and that's definitely one of the big pros that the municipal representatives felt is that they got um, better service faster than they would have otherwise. Um, and then of course, as well, another big advantage they mentioned was having the in-house expertise. So they, their model involved having there's different levels of management after the project is completed. So there's was kind of what they call the level two. So they had an outside manager involved, but it still was largely managed by the municipality. Um, so they had basically an in-house person who could come and deal with issues right away. They didn't have to wait for um, an outside ISP provider to service residents. Those are the two big advantages that they mentioned. And, and would you say PIC2 is comparable to North Grenville? I don't know much about the community. We could send Councillor Strack again down the road and check it out, but is it a sort of a rural, small town? Do yeah. You, do you know the population of it, for example? I don't know the population off the top of my head. I believe it's bigger area-wise, um, but population, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Okay. Well, I, you know, my personal opinion, I think it's a model to explore uh, and find out more about how they did and how fast it could roll out. I guess it really depends on uh, the financial model that, that we, we come, come to agreement on. Uh, I, are there other companies that, that have used that model besides that one in PIC2? I mean, Burkett, have you entertained that, uh, that model for rolling out your technology? Um, we've actually done some things um, with uh, as an example, North Stormont. Um, Chris Ranklers, do you want to talk to that at all? Well, North, North Stormont, um, I'm not sure it's quite the same, but with North Stormont, uh, we entered into, um, into what I would call a, a fairly sizable contra deal um, where we outfitted uh, high-speed services to all of the municipal um, buildings in the township, um, 
So that would be um, in Finch, in uh, Berwick, Berwick where the main office is, uh, Chrysler, um, uh, Moose Creek, and I think that's it. Um, and so uh, we provided free internet service to their buildings in exchange for real estate on their water towers and places and things like that. So they're vertical assets. And um, they gave us permission and full access to those assets. So it, um, it, it, it was, uh, it, it, there, was no, there was no money that exchanged hands for that piece. However, the township did um, provide about 40 to 45K of uh, funding to assist with the initial capital expenses and, and investment on our part. Otherwise, it would have been a fairly sizable investment on our part um, without an immediate return on investment because we would have not had any new customers hooked up yet for you know six months or a year to come. So it takes time to hook up customers. They don't come on the first day unless you've got a pent up demand in a certain area and they can just hook up uh, you know within the first two weeks or three weeks that you have a tower built. So um, so that was kind of how North Stormont worked. Um, I can't speak to whether that you know is, is in any way related to what's going on in pick two but um, but that was how that um, was set up. And again it's not um, an arrangement that a large player and I'm not I'm not trying to promote storm here but it's not the kind of thing that's easily done by a large player. Um, small players like Storm can adapt to those kinds of contra arrangements and can make um, cost-effective decisions to make to provide solutions for for municipalities in that manner. So it's it's a way to it's a way to consider doing it. And and the uh, other things that we read about while we were doing that um, study, um, we included some. Uh, some areas in the U.S. Um, that had raised bonds in order to, to pay um, over 25 years um, the, the capital cost for putting putting in fiber to every home. So they actually came forward and put a bond together, and uh, then people paid it paid it um, uh, off with with uh, fees on their taxes in order property taxes in order to uh, pay back the community um, to pay off that bond. I don't know whether that fits in your finance model, but it might be interesting. I know Hillary looked at a number of different options while she was working on it. Yeah, I guess my interest in the model is just that it might uh, get us wired uh, faster. Um, uh, absolutely, because yeah. the biggest thing is, unless there's a break even for, for a, a player, that like Joe's Computing or Storm or ExplorerNet, that's, that's uh, somewhere in the three and a half to five year range, um, we, we won't come. Um, because there's other places where we can de get that break even within time. And, and all of the ISPs that we dealt with in this, when we were talking through the survey, all of them ha have some kind of threshold they have to get to, to be able to, you know, they're in business. So they have to make their money back at some point. Okay, okay thank you. Any final uh, comments before we move on? I just have a couple of closing questions. Council striking in, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor Peckford. So I guess my comments are more sort of general for overall. I mean, I think it's a great idea to put in uh, pipes and give access and so on where, you know, those are seem like relatively straightforward things that we could accomplish to accommodate access and, and future development and, and so on. I guess uh, my general comment is, is that our surveys are not the way to get the right information. And it's just not this one in particular, but 4% and the majority coming from Kempville and not being able to find out what businesses are truly feeling. I mean, I think there are a lot of people working from home who are working from home, not simply because of the pandemic, but because that's their home business and, and where they choose to work from. So I think that, um, you know, I, we just, again, this is a municipal issue. I think we just need to figure out a better way to get these this information because, um, I, I live outside of Kempville, and so I'd say that the situation is far more dire than what is actually represented in the statistics, um, and I think that's probably understood, but uh, it's, uh, it's hard to um, rely on those to be the driver behind making decisions, especially um, when other technologies are uh, coming up and it, you know, uh, I'll, I'll say Starlink is the example, but you know, it's not affordable for all and it's a, certainly an, a, a big upfront investment, but a lot of people are moving in that direction because they just got stuck, right? And they don't see any improvements. So, um, you know, we're, we'll have to um, 
I'll have to figure out some the right way to convince people if there's going to be a tax burden, um, why it is that uh, this should be something that uh, everybody should invest in for the, uh, you know, sort of, so to speak, for the greater good of the municipality. But thank you very much for the presentation. I think it's uh, important that we continue to talk about this. Um, so thank you, Councilor Strachan. So uh, Burkett and team, uh, like given what you've presented today, what are the top three actions you think we should be taking other than making sure there's anytime there's underground works, right? We create that capacity for fiber cables to be run and rented, right? In those um, underground conduits, if you will. What, it, in your opinion, or Hillary, maybe you have this answer as well. Like what, what in the short term, what do we need to do? Um, and maybe before I, I, I ask you to answer that question, I, I should say that as some will be aware, um, the municipality did submit letters of endorsement for two internet service provider generated proposals back in March and one was from Bell and one was from Kojiko. We understand those are bigger players. Uh, they don't always pay attention to, um, you know, those areas that are where the most urgently needed upgrades are often they are going after low hanging fruit. So we accept that, but these were proposals that were generated, um, you know, from the internet service providers themselves. And by virtue of the fact that we are so poorly served and I, I'm very grateful for the data because as we know in the past CRTC, some of the CRTC data has suggested that North Granville is far better connected than it actually is. So this is at least helpful to have a more granular view of what service levels look like. Um, we are you know, awaiting uh, news uh, about whether or not one of the two or both ISP proposals that were submitted to the feds in the province back in March, April um, does get approval. So you know, those notwithstanding the prospect of one or both of those proceeding, Burkitt, um, is there, a, you know, what is the low hanging fruit here? Well, I think Hillary uh, helped summarize it on the strategic priority slide. Yeah. Um, so, so I think really, um, you know, you might run a panel where you invite a bunch of the local ISPs to come and and visit and you can invite Bell and Kojiko and they may or may not show up um, because you don't have 5,000 people perhaps that are immediately available for, for connection. But anyway, um, I think that, that uh, in engaging your local ISPs and making them, uh, making people aware that, I mean, that, that um, in order for you to get somebody to invest in your community, to bring, bring dollars to, to get things going, I really think that uh, um, you know there are programs right now through the federal um, uh, federal programs, and there's a brand new program that literally I got my invite yesterday to to come and see. And I think you're probably aware of that, uh, Mayor Peckford, um, the the uh, the new provincial Ontario connections uh, um, program. Have you, have you heard about that? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yep. we haven't been told how the ISPs are going to do a reverse auction, but that's apparently what we're going to get told about next week. It's being managed by KP, KPMG on their behalf, and we'll we'll see what actually happens and, and whether it makes sense for us to invest our our revenues um, and our our money in in helping that happen. Um, I, I like I like um, some pieces of the model where um, uh, the community gets involved and, and actually decides that they want want to do something. Um, the, the reason pick to work for the people um, in, in the, that area is because the community led it and the community put the initial funding in to help it happen. And it engaged a couple of different suppliers to, to help them get different areas within their, within their group. And so that, that is part of the way that things got delivered. Um, and making sure that uh, people do get communications um, in the in a way that uh, they can understand. So, for instance, on your website, is there something that says, "Here's the ISPs that serve our area"? Um, is is uh, do people actually realize that it's not all it's not all Bell and Kojiko that can provide mm -hmm. things all the time, um, or Rogers? Rogers does the stuff in the very north of of, of the area, so mm -hmm. they're up in North Gore, kind of. Um, so those kinds of things. And then, um, you know, I, I, I'm waiting to see the evolution of the gig project to see whether it actually takes off or not. 
because that's an important piece uh, of, of the, um, the puzzle. If you can get the gig project, which is basically um, a thousand megabits to every household availability, um, that will actually future proof you and, and put you on an even footing with, with a, an urban area. Um, so that's kind of important uh, on that. So those are, uh, I think you've already talked, uh, Hillary, about the MAA standards. Yep, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, I'm gonna get to that in my report, which I'll go over shortly okay. here. Okay. Uh, anyway, th there's a number of things, um, you know, we're involved in, in uh, various uh, projects across Eastern Ontario, and it, 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 uh, it does help that, the, that there is um, some funding available um, mm -hmm. to, to make to make it possible, I, I think the, uh, um, the you know one of the quotes in the report um, uh, uh, addresses that by saying that you know you basically the gap can only be closed through government's financial participation. The level of government participation must be at least to the point where the private in industry sector can um, participate profitably. Without this level of support, the private sector would not undertake this important communications infrastructure. Because if you ask your economic development officer or your realtors in your area, um, nothing happens till um, the sixth um, utility, which happens to be the first utility in most people's mind, what kind of internet can I get if I move to North Grenville? That's what people want to know. And, and so if you want to solve the problem, you have to think about what does it look like now and what's it going to look like in the future and how can you lead as a municipality, how can you lead, lead this and, uh, and get some kind of a framework that allows people to profitably um, produce the internet you want, unless you want to make it a municipal utility, which I don't know that you want to. Okay, thank you. Okay, so then maybe we'll move on. Uh, Hillary, I don't see that there's a report as part of uh, tonight's documentation, but I, you're referring to one, so I'll let you speak to that. Yeah, sure. It's just under the CAO section there. Ah, uh, uh, okay, thank that? you. Yep. Okay, so I'll just briefly go through um, a little bit about what the recommendations mean for the municipality moving forward. Uh, Storm and CIP have obviously done a great job on the technical side of things and it's a very thorough report, uh, but I wanna thank them for working on this throughout the process as well. Um, so firstly, staff will be moving forward to encourage investment attraction for broadband infrastructure. As mentioned in uh, the presentation, this includes investigating best practices for partnerships with ISPs and looking at what other communities are doing, meeting with ISPs to better determine their needs, providing letters of support for funding as they come up on a needs basis, and informing residents about community builds and overall better in communications regarding broadband initiatives and developments. We'll also continue to support ongoing initiatives, including EORN's gig project and cell gap project. Um, as we've talked about before, and Mayor Pepper brought up at a meeting with EORN and Rogers, uh, there could be an opportunity to capitalize on the cell gap project to improve wireless, uh, fixed wireless access. And as Burkett mentioned in the presentation, provide access to municipal property where appropriate, which we already do on a needs by needs basis, but we're creating a more um, fulsome process for this. We are also currently working on establishing municipal access agreements or MAAs with various IAPs and formalizing that process overall so that when an ISP does come forward with a development or a proposal, we're ready to uh, action it quickly. So to enact all this during the study, it became apparent that an internal team was needed to review broadband developments. So we created what I like to call the broadband review team. Uh, who will review any proposals and assist ISPs as needed. So that was kind of already being done on a, um, when needed to, uh, but now we're just looking to formalize that process so we can keep things moving for our, uh, those that are looking to develop. And I'd also like to note, which has come up tonight, that since the writing of this report, the provincial government announced the uh, Connect Ontario uh, procurement program that will allow ISPs to bid for provincial support for projects defined as underserved areas. So they haven't told us where those underserved areas are, what geographic locations, um, but we're actively trying to find more information out and working with our ISPs to see uh, how they'll be um, applying for that program. So we'll continue to monitor such developments as this one and capitalize on available funds and support where we can. 
So we look forward to continuing to work on the initiatives proposed in the study to better local connectivity across all of North Grenville. And I'm happy to take any other questions if there are any. I don't see um, any other questions. I, I would suggest, however, that um, my understanding of the announcement yesterday and in recent, very recent conversations with Yorn um, is this, the, the obvious um, elephant in the room is that uh, GIG is not necessarily being funded in the way that Yorn had hoped at this time. Um, I think it is definitely uh, worthy of ongoing consideration. And I think once the province gets its head around how this program rolls out uh, and what gets underserved, what's easily resolved from an underserved perspective, then I think EORN is likely to go back to the provincial table with a kind of gig 2.0. But I think we understand that sort of the EORN vision as presented on the gig project will likely need to uh, adapt to current funding opportunities. So, you know, on that, note, I think we do have to be kind of vigilant um, about what are the opportunities. At this point, we're really relying on those ISPs to generate their own proposals and tell us where they want, you know, to potentially uh, move forward with investment, of course, with federal provincial dollars. But I don't, I think, I think the, the real question for council is, or some of our smaller ISPs is, can more be done where we know the the big players won't go, right? And how do we make that happen? How do we create the conditions for that to happen? I don't think that's a conversation for this evening, but I think that's the big question at this stage. Um, I'll recognize Councillor Sullivan because she has her hand up. Thank you. Um, I, th I think that um, it's important that we know how the, the requirements, the infrastructure requirements will be communicated to municipalities, like uh, I'm not sure that Public Works knew that it would be very valuable to have laid a uh, four inch conduit for fiber optic cables or for any kind of infrastructure for, for better internet when major road works were being done. Um, so how is this being communicated to municipalities and Public Works departments? And the other question is, I think that the, the study that uh, Brickett, Brickett um, presented this evening certainly showed that there was a lot of dissatisfaction from residential and businesses, but given the number of people that were just from Kempville and given the fact that it was just online and during lockdown times, I, I, it's probably not anywhere near representative of how significant the issue is. And um, I know right in Kempville that uh, my son-in-law just in Victoria Park had to download three users to my house because he couldn't have four, three kids in school and himself working online at the same time. And that's still right in Kempville. So I think the issue is probably worse than we even think. And, uh, and uh, as much as I appreciate the study, I think it might have even been worse if we had gotten more response from outside of the Kempville urban area. So anyway, so my question, other main question is how do public works departments know what they need to do when they're doing major road works? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it's interesting kind of to Burkett's point that he made earlier that this is kind of the sixth utility, even though it's everyone's priority is there is no um, mandates for it provincially wide, right? And so uh, luckily we're fortunate to have the study done and we know to do that now. I don't know about other communities, how they know to do this kind of stuff. Um, some have the internal capacity, right? Some have a specific IT department or they're looking at managing a network internally um, so they would have staff on on site who know how to do that kind of who know to do that stuff. Um, and if you read the Roma, do, excuse me, um, if you read the Roma document, um, which is the Rural Ontario Municipal Association document, they make recommendations that there are things you can do to help um, ISPs with with this kind of thing. And the uh, the folks from um, from North Dundas have actually passed a resolution that says every time we do a culvert, there will be a four inch conduit going beside it, unless there's no houses around it at all. 
Um, so, so they are actually they have actually adopted that, and I know that um, uh, the new warden for SDNG is is Al Armstrong, and he's looking at doing that across the whole of SDNG because um, he 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 really believes that having internet in the countryside is the only way that that they can recruit and retain both businesses and and residents. Okay. Sounds good. I see Councillor Barkley. I know this delegation has long gone on longer than expected. I think we're muddling our way through here, um, uh, council colleagues and, and delegation representatives uh, to try to figure out a way forward, like tangibly, uh, is there you know anything in particular that we can help to drive, right? Because we know the bigger players in particular aren't are gonna solve all our problems and some of the most pernicious problems will likely never be solved. Um, and you know the status of I guess low orbit satellite is to to be determined. Uh, Council Barkley, did you have your hand up? I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, I'd like I, I agree with you, Madam Mayor, that I'd like to see us be a little bit more active rather than sitting and waiting for ISPs to approach us. And I, I don't mean to characterize that's what you've been doing, Hillary, but but uh, with the report, I think the interesting information is uh, that I'm hearing tonight is that rollout can be faster. Uh, if we explore a partnership, a public-private partnership, that's where we, we can uh, actually invest in it and get the ball rolling. So I'd like to see um, uh, more uh, research and, and outreach to uh, companies that uh, do get involved with public-private partnerships, as well as the smaller ISPs, because the other example, uh, this contrary example, I know it only uh, wired uh, municipal buildings in, in North Dundas, but there are other creative ways that we can actually be more active in uh, getting a rollout uh, rather than waiting for the, the big boys to uh, wait till we're big enough to, uh, or lucrative enough to uh, come and approach us. I, I'd like to see us talk to smaller ISPs and to explore public private partnerships. Uh, and um, I guess I could put that in a motion uh, and maybe somebody would second it. So uh, just move to direct staff to explore relationships with smaller ISPs, uh, including uh, a revenue sharing model with uh, internet service companies to roll out faster than, than we're currently, we, you know, in other words, I guess that's as far as I need to go, but, yeah. okay. but uh, just get the ball rolling. Thanks. Uh, so it, if, I, if I have it right, Council Barkley, you are moving a motion. And if that's the case, I'll look for a second there. Yeah. Thank you. I've got Deputy Mayor. Um, Ms. Babcock-Cormier, did you capture that? The meeting is recorded, Your Worship, so yes. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so to that end, I know there was uh, a motion to receive the report, but let's deal with this one first. Um, colleagues, any comments on this? Obviously, we've had almost an hour discussion on rural internet and now to move forward. So uh, I'm not expecting further discussion, but if you have it, Councilor Strachan, go ahead. Yeah, I think that uh, one of the areas that um, we need to understand as well is not just that it's, um, you know, not great connectivity throughout the municipality, but that the internet service providers that we have, it's a patchwork system, right? So if you live in Oxford Mills, don't expect the same service provider to give you the same level of service in Oxford Station or anywhere else in our municipality. So I think that, um, you know, the conversation about what this private, uh, the P3 kind of partnership looks like is even more complex than just being able to talk to you know one particular group I think that you know it almost requires a, a consortium of sorts um, because there isn't one overarching group um, and even when it comes to the major players um, you know uh, I can access you know Bell uh, sort of their wi-fi kind of uh, rural internet service where I live but uh, half a kilometer down the road it doesn't even exist for them so it, it really depends on where you are in, in the municipality and I think we all know that and I think residents all understand that because uh, they experience it um, so I, I, do, I don't know how uh, a p3 partnership works when you don't have you know a, a single person to go with and how that gets more complicated but I, I you know I'm sure there's a way to address that I just wanted to highlight that that's a you know another level of complexity that we have to deal with for sure Councillor Barkley yeah, I guess the gist of my motion is that we should take a more active role in, mm -hmm. in finding out what would work. And yep. and uh, I, I agree that it's possibly complicated to put together a consortia and organize a public-private partnership, but we have to be creative. Uh, the only other comment I would make is that, you know, um, people are very interested in moving here uh, 
but uh, what we need to balance our revenue, our residential tax revenue against commercial revenue. So I'm hoping that, you know, if we can roll out faster than neighboring communities to, to be wired, uh, that we'll have uh, a lot of businesses moving here, uh, not necessarily into Kempfel, but into the outlying areas where people want to live and uh, do, the, do their businesses from where they live out in the rural areas. So uh, I'd like to be more competitive down the road uh, to attract people who have businesses and want to work in a rural setting. So uh, that would be the gist of it. And I think um, your, your motion can be inclusive of more than one private actor, right? I think um, as per, I think a discussion we had at CDAC, it was obvious that, um, Birgit, your feedback was, and I don't need you to comment on this right now, but certainly that there are multiple players, smaller players in the field. And that if you work together and coordinate it where you already have infrastructure and where you can leverage that infrastructure, uh, that you might be able to, I think, close the gap on some of the past work, right? And you're absolutely right, Councilor Strzok, yeah, and it's a, it's a huge problem. And I would argue on the same street or within the same neighborhood, sometimes just depending on your, your house or commercial properties location, right? You are being differently served. So it's um, it's a dog's breakfast, quite frankly. So uh, I have a motion, we have a seconder. I think the intent of the motion is clear. Is there any further comment by council? Seeing none, um, I will call the question on that. All in favor, please. Good, thank you. Uh, so thank you. I know this is a long and sordid discussion in some respects, but I think we have to find our way through. And, and I've been around a county council table, county council, county's council table, where we have seen Leeds in a Thousand Islands and Rita Lakes actually are both have been extremely proactive on, on trying to um, assume sovereignty, if you will, over closing some of the gaps. So I think uh, it would be great to see what we can what we can do here. Uh, without waiting for the bigger players to, to come in uh, and they will only come in if they're heavily subsidized to do so. And, and that, that might be valuable and we welcome it. And I've uh, asked all the right questions at both levels of government about when that funding might come in, but it will never solve all of our problems. It might solve a, a few of them. Okay, um, so that is the delegation. Um, Ms. Janu, you did give your report, which we could find under the CAO's report. And I appreciate that clarification. Um, in addition to the motion uh, that Council Barkley and Deputy Mayor have just moved the second and we've adopted, um, Ms. Babcock-Cormier, do we have to now receive the report? Is that still prudent for us to do? Yes, Your Worship. It would be that Council receive the presentation titled North Grenville Broadband Study for Information Purposes and receive and adopt the Municipality of North Grenville Broadband Study, June 2021. Okay. Uh, so I have Councillor Sullivan and Councillor Strachan. We were a seconder. Okay, I'm going to call the question unless there's further comment. I don't see any. All in favor, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, um, Ms. Janu, for your work and uh, the storm team for really, uh, you know, giving this a hard look. And I know the survey results, uh, you know, were what they could have been, but certainly I think the technical analysis of what is being offered in the municipality is still extremely relevant to how we work to close those gaps. So, you know, the survey is one thing, but the engineering and technical analysis is also, I think, meaningful. Um, and we will carry on uh, with the struggle and hope, hope to see some kind of custom made initiatives for North Granville to uh, improve its, its rural broadband so it is far more reliable and far speedier than we know people's experiences are. So thanks, thanks to everyone for their efforts. So we will uh, move on then, uh, colleagues. Uh, we now have the consent agenda and of course consent agenda items are considered routine or no longer require for the discussion and therefore are enacted in one motion. Of course, any council colleague reserves the right to pull an item uh, from the consent agenda. You'll see uh, basically multiple sets of minutes as part of uh, tonight's consent agenda. Uh, I don't think I have to list them all, but they include Old Town Campbell BIA, North Granville Public Library minutes, uh, committee minutes and council minutes. So colleagues looking to you, is there any set of minutes you would like to pull for discussion this evening? Seeing none, I'll look for a mover and a seconder uh, for the consent agenda items to be approved as presented. Mover, please. I've got Councilor Strachan and uh, Councilor Barkley moving and seconding. If there is no further comment, I'll call the question, please. All in favor. Okay. 
So that is our consent agenda. Thank you very much. I think that speeds some things up, but I would like to, to thank the good work of Old Town BIA. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Ms. Deb Wilson back to the BIA. She's come, she's resumed uh, activity with the BIA as a member, uh, though of course she is no longer chair. And uh, in addition to that, we know that the North Granville Public Library is doing some great work as are many of our committees. Um, and it's wonderful to see the, the activity and the enthusiasm uh, at that level. Uh, so with that in mind, under the office of the CEO, we've dealt with the North Granville Broadband Study. I'll just go to Mr. Dyke. I don't think there's anything else that you wish to speak to this evening? Not this time, Rachel. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dyke. Uh, then we'll uh, go to Office of the Clerk, and I understand that we have to, I think, reauthorize our own capacity to meet electronically uh, in these COVID times. So, Ms. Beth Cormier, over to you. Thank you, Worship. That's correct. The municipality's procedural bylaw permits council meetings to be conducted electronically until August the 18th, 2021. To ensure the continued ability to hold council meetings virtually in whole or in part past that date, it's necessary to amend the procedural bylaw to remove that sunset provision. The continued flexibility to hold council meetings virtually is prudent to address situations in which some or all members of council or its committees are not able to meet in person and to ensure continued quorum. Good. So obviously, uh, I think Council and many of the committees hope to resume some in-person activity, but we uh, clearly should, at a prudence, if nothing else, um, reserve the right to convene virtually. Uh, so Council colleagues, I assume you're supportive of that option at the present time, and I'll look for a move in our seconder. Okay, I've got Deputy Mayor and Councillor Sullivan, thank you. So we're uh, obviously moving and seconding. Uh, the bylaw to amend procedural bylaw 419 uh, to authorize continuing authority to conduct electronic meetings. And I assume, I'm sorry, Ms. Beth Cormier, that does also apply to our municipal advisory committees. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Worship. Okay. Uh, Council colleagues, any discussions or concern on meeting virtually? I know we have a plan as a council to come together. God willing, in September, as long as nothing goes south on our public health measures, I'll, I'll take a question from Councillor Sullivan and Councillor Barkley and Councillor Sharkian. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I, I just wanted to confirm if I understood that correctly, that some or all of the, the members of the of council or the committee, so it could be a hybrid situation where we could be meeting at the municipal centre and then some people could join virtually, correct? I believe that's the case, but I'll talk, to, I'll ask Ms. Babcock Cormier to answer in terms of our technological capacities. To you, Your Worship, that is correct. The change to the procedural bylaw to extend that date indefinitely would permit hybrid meetings. Now that staff are back in the office, we can continue uh, along the path of ensuring that the technology will catch up to the possibility. Okay. Great. That's that's great. Thank you very much. I apologize. I don't remember who was second. I think Councillor Strachan and then Councillor Barkley. Just go in that order. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, for those of you who aren't aware, I'm in Halifax right now. So I think I would benefit from this kind of uh, scenario. Um, but uh, to um, just highlight what we've learned over the last year and a half is that, um, you know, when people are sick, some people don't stay home because they feel obligated to attend meetings and so on. And we just learned that from our everyday life and work and school and so on and it certainly applies to council meetings so I think that that's an important option to have you know you feel under the other uh, under the weather and now you're not uh, you know um, not meeting your obligations and that kind of thing as well um, and then further to that I think that this is a very important point when it comes to just overall um, inclusiveness and accessibility um, that we have this as an option for people because um, it's not always um, you know it's not always uh, uh, works to uh, attend in in person for a variety of reasons. So um, thank you. I, uh, I think this is a, a great decision. Excellent. Uh, Council Barkley, and then I'll go to Deputy Mayor. My questions have been answered. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay, Deputy Mayor. Just just a quick question. Maybe uh, this is for our CEO or, or for Heather. Um, has the province um, talked about uh, rescinding this rule? Uh, going forward, or is that uh, a real? Is it going to be status quo? What they put in place so far? Ms. Babcock Cormier, can you comment on that, or maybe Mr. Dyke? Through you, Your Worship. 
There is no indication that the province is going to uh, change the provisions in the Municipal Act to not permit electronic meetings in the future. They have, in fact, actually changed the provisions in the Municipal Act to allow electronic meetings to proceed, regardless of whether there's a declaration of emergency or not. Thank you. Okay, any other comments, colleagues? Seeing none, I think uh, underlying any hybrid or ongoing virtual model, of course, is good broadband. So, you know, some of those advisory committee members from, you know, Hexton, Bishop Smells, Oxford Station, Birds Rapids, right, may want to avail of the uh, hybrid option of uh, participating virtually. They need good broadband to do so. So hopefully that will, that will come. I'll call the question, colleagues, all in favor? Good, thank you. Uh, so, oh, I apologize, I just muted myself by mistake. Um, so next we will uh, move on. Uh, nothing under planning and development this evening, uh, though there was a Folsom planning meeting a week ago that some of you will remember. So uh, lots happening on that file. Uh, under public works, we have the child drainage uh, loan uh, motion. And I believe Mr. Sly is here this evening uh, to give us a lowdown, is that right? All right, uh, Mr. Sly, you are muted. We cannot hear your audio. It could be that you haven't plugged in. You're not muted on our screen. Is, is that better? It is, thank you. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, the staff report I have for consideration is the finalization of the, dra uh, the tile drain loan application. On May 4th, 2021, council supported the tile drainage loan application for Ms. Sarah Ramson for part of lot 12 concession eight within the former township of Oxford on Rideau. In early June, 2021, a provincially licensed tile installer installation contractor completed the tile drainage works, but due to land order constraints, the original 43 acres to be tile drain was reduced in scope to approximately 38 acres. Following the tile drain installation, the municipal tile drain inspector assessed the completed works and deemed the works acceptable under the framework of the application. Based on the revised scope of work and final contractor invoicing, the maximum loan amount has been adjusted to $34,000. It is a recommended, recommended that council pass and enact by, a bylaw for the tile drainage loan for the amount of $34,000 subject to the availability of provincial funding, authorize the mayor, clerk, director of finance and the tile drain inspector to sign the application and execute all documents necessary to facilitate the loan with the Min Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. It should be noted that the uh, available provincial funds are considered flow through and are administered by the municipality with no taxation burden on municipal landowners. This concludes my report, unless there are any questions. Thank you. Colleagues, any questions or concerns about this particular motion? No, tile drainage is important. We're glad to see that the um, motion is intended to respond to the needs that were articulated. Uh, so I'll look for a mover, Council Barkley, if you wanna take that, and a, a seconder, please. Deputy Mayor, thank you. Um, and the recommendation for Council is that we pass on an act by law 7521 for the tile drainage loan for part of lot 12, concession eight, geographic township of Oxford on Rideau in the amount stated 34,000. Subject to availability, and that we authorize the mayor, clerk, director of finance, and the municipal tile drain inspector to sign the application and authorize the inspector to execute all necessary documents to, facilitate, to facilitate the loan with the Ministry of Agriculture. I've got a mover and a seconder. I'll call the question unless there are comments. Okay. Did we call the question? Just vote for me. Good. All right. It's passed. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Slide, for your efforts. Appreciate you being here. Okay, so we'll move on to the gateway signage update. I believe, um, happy to see this on the agenda and I believe Mr. Rogue, you are on deck for that. Thank you. Uh, good evening all and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm here this evening to discuss a recent project which was implemented by the Public Works Department. Uh, this project more specifically referred to as the 40 kilometer per hour gateway signage program was implemented to evaluate two specific items. Uh, the first being the gateway signage installation process, which is simply the process of posting any speed limit at the entrance and exit of an area to designate the legal speed limit within the same area. Uh, the second item uh, was the general reduction of speed limit from 50 kilometers an hour to 40 kilometers per hour within the urban core of North Granville. In general, the program was successful 
uh, with respect to posting signage, the Public Works Department intends to use gateway signage wherever possible moving forward. The Public Works also intends to adjust existing and future gateway signage to be more consistent with neighboring municipalities. With respect to the reduction in speed limit, the Public Works Department has not seen a significant change in driver behavior. It is, it is assumed that this is due to several factors. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which has affected traffic patterns due to stay-at-home orders. Uh, some roadways were already in compliance with the 40 km per hour speed limit. And that a speed limit must work together with physical characteristics and engineering of the roadway to ensure compliance long term. Although, although the prog program uh, did not reduce speed on its own, it was a necessary step uh, and has been and has supported the Public Works Department while evaluating roadways from a traffic calming perspective. This program has led to more measures being recommended, which may not have been recommended in the past. These two processes work together to reduce vehicle speeds. Overall, the program has had many positive outcomes within the urban area of North Granville. Moving forward, the Public Works Department intends to expand this program to evaluate a reduction of speed limit in rural areas of North Granville, specifically rural hamlets and subdivisions. Uh, the Public Works Department intends to run the rural program similar to that of the urban program. Uh, we will plan to install and evaluate a reduced scale program to then establish a plan for a full scale implementation. Uh, council will be updated as we move through this process. This program will be focused more on a uh, reduced speed limit and less on the gateway signage process. Um, the Public Works Department will be using gateway signage to install reduced speed limits where feasible and standard speed limit signage where uh, elsewhere. Similarly to the urban program, the United Counties of Leeds and Granville will play a major role in this program. This concludes my report, and are there any questions? Yeah, so I have a, an initial question and then look to colleagues. I'm eager to see this underway, so really appreciate the report out on the, uh, obviously, the urban gateway signage um, project, if you will. I rarely hear someone say that they think uh, the speed limits shouldn't have been reduced to 40, but quite the opposite. So I think I concur with you in terms of what uh, you articulate, Mr. Bro, is the positive benefits of reducing the speed limit and keeping it really simple, which is always helpful. Um, I would like to know what the timeline is for rural hamlets and some of the rural subdivisions. I know the subdivisions are within our full control, I believe, whereas obviously some of the rural hamlets require some county cooperation and collaboration. I know some of those hamlets have been patiently waiting uh, to see if they could be part of a pilot project or have their speeds reduced permanently. So I am interested in knowing what the rollout is. I, I, it didn't see a mention of timeline in this. Yeah, so a timeline at this point is uh, uh, purely speculative, but we would like to see a, a reduced program uh, a smaller scale program implemented prior to the end of the year this year. Um, typically what we need to do is um, collect data on all of the areas that we're looking at uh, and see where best we can, uh, where best the data will uh, be able to support moving to a full scale program. So we'll, we will be working with, uh, um, with staff to collect data within all of our hamlets and subdivisions and then establish where we can, uh, where would it would make sense to implement that reduced scale project. Um, with that being said, once it is established that we have a, a smaller scale, uh, that will lead into anticipated next year, we will be evaluating uh, in early uh, 2022 of those smaller scale to provide a plan to council for a full scale implementation, uh, whatever that will look like um, to be implemented next year. Uh, that, that's uh, what the anticipated schedule is. Um, the next update would definitely be uh, um, in the fall of this year. Great, and before I go to Deputy Mayor, just to be clear, you're using, um, I assume, all available summer resources uh, to the extent possible to do that data collection, which would lead you to then, I'm hearing, launch a pilot of some sort, which would include some collection of rural hamlets, rural subdivisions uh, in late 2021. 
with an expectation that based upon those results, a, a more fulsome program would be pursued. I, I'm assuming we're going to ballpark here the summer of 2022. Is there, uh, do the counties present, do I, first of all, Mr. Bro, do I have that right? And number two, do the counties at this stage present any issues or is that to be determined at this stage? Uh, yes, you have that, uh, that process correct. Um, I, I can't speak fully towards the, uh, the county involvement up until this point. Uh, there have been preliminary conversations, but until we have that plan moving forward, we won't, uh, we won't know their, their, the, we won't know if we have their uh, approval and support uh, until we provide that to them. Okay. Well, as you know, I sit at that table and as I've said repeatedly, um, there's certainly a, a shared political appetite among uh, county councillors to ensure that um, relevant municipalities uh, have the tools they need to ensure that speed is well managed in their communities. So I don't anticipate any political concerns, but I hear you in terms of conferring with your public works and technical colleagues. Okay, this is, uh, this is uh, soliciting um, all kinds of conversations. So I see Deputy Mayor and Council Barkley. So I'll go to Deputy Mayor first. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the question to staff would be, um, uh, is uh, you mentioned, uh, Ryan, the, the data, and you mentioned the speed limits uh, didn't seem to be reduced. What's the process for collecting that data? Like before we put these signs up in that area, did you spend a couple of weeks uh, you know, with, science, with speed measurement and then collect that data and then do a before and after kind of thing? And is that what you're going to do when, when you pick other areas? Do you spend a couple of weeks to, you know, measuring the speed and then checking it again later at a similar time and event? You know, I mean, summer, winter could be different, to, you know, if you're doing collecting data for speed. So I'm just wondering about how that, what that process looks like um, to, and how you determine that the speeds didn't drop or did drop. Uh, if you could have, if you can answer that, thank you. Definitely. Uh, so with respect to the program in the urban area, uh, which will be very similar to the rural area, uh, we establish localized areas that we can collect data. Um, a lot of the time we do focus on areas that uh, that we have historic data for, that we have a number of years worth of data so that we have that, uh, that trend uh, that we can apply to the program. Um, obviously there are areas that we don't have any data. So we, we go out, typically our process is a 24 hour um, the data collection. We try and stay away from uh, any, any unfavorable weather events, uh, holidays, that type thing. Um, so once we have that 24 hour data, we, uh, we evaluate it to determine if it, if it is what was anticipated. For example, one of the, uh, one of the uh, assessments that we looked at this year was Heard Street. The first 24 hour assessment did not, uh, did not correlate to uh, some of the other uh, data that we have historically. So we ended up uh, increasing from a 24 hour to a full week assessment and which did uh, correlate to uh, historic data. So we, we try and look at areas when, when making these conclusions, we, we try and look at areas that we have a number of years worth of data and not just a, just a one day last year compared to one day this year, because we don't want any, uh, any skewed data or anything like that. So um, there are a number of areas that we have been doing over over a number of years. Uh, so we, we do have that data to go back to. Thank you. Okay, I think I have Councillor Barkley. Go ahead, Councillor Barkley. Uh, yeah, thank you. And, and thank you, Ryan, for, for the update. Uh, the, my takeaways are that uh, uh, lowering the speed from 40 is, is just part of the puzzle uh, in changing driver behavior. So uh, the fact that we haven't seen a significant change in, in that behavior right off the bat uh, doesn't surprise me. It's going to take some time. It also take enforcement. And I just would uh, like to remind the rest of the council that uh, the police service board has uh, taken a look at uh, reviewing and revising its protocols for uh, addressing uh, resident traffic concerns. And uh, I, I just note, uh, Brian, that you got a lot of that information directly to the OPP and, and uh, they're very appreciative of, of that data, the uh, road assessment or the road speed, the speed assessment data. So uh, hopefully uh, one of the outcomes uh, of the signage, uh, the gateway signage uh, program in K-12 
Kenful is eventually uh, changing that driver behavior. Um, the other thing, I think the other takeaway or uh, benefit of this pilot program within the urban core was uh, the level of cooperation that we've, we've had from county because county roads go through almost all of the hamlets as well as uh, Kenful. And uh, we set a precedent uh, with their cooperation with the gateway signage program in Kenful. And, and uh, hopefully I expect we'll have the same kind of cooperation for them as we approach the hamlets. Speaking of the hamlets and the rural subdivision, as you know, Ryan, each, each of them are unique. Uh, they have different uh, traffic patterns and different roads. So part, part of your uh, study or evaluation of rolling this out into the rural areas, I think would, would be uh, to look at the low hanging fruit. I think it's probably easier in some hamlets than others to, to uh, uh, institute a, a gateway signage program. So I look forward to that happening uh, as soon as possible. So, um, because uh, I think we got the ball rolling and we got to keep it rolling because uh, a lot of people have been watching what we've done in Kenful, uh, a lot of people in the rural areas and they're very anxious to see it uh, applied uh, to their specific situation. So uh, I, I hope that we uh, take a look at the low hanging fruit and, and get that program up and running as soon as possible. Thanks. Okay, uh, Councillor Strachan has a question and then I recognize Councillor O'Sullivan. Councillor Strachan? Thank you, Madam Mayor. So uh, thank you. I, I mean, I agree with what uh, Councillor Barkley has just mentioned about driver behavior and the enforcement piece. I mean, I think those are two key parts to it. Um, I live close enough to Rideau River Road to know that that 60 kilometer zone is most effective when there has been a bit of a police presence to uh, remind people that they shouldn't be blasting through their 80 plus, um, which still happens often, but you know, uh, it's slowly changing behavior. And, uh, I, you know, I think it comes with time. So I, I definitely think that uh, those are important pieces there. And the following two things I'm going to say are completely contradictory. Um, you know, I'm, I, I am a, I'm a scientist by, uh, by design, I, you know, data, I understand the importance of all that I, I get that, you know, we want to be able to say, uh, very quantitatively, you know, what has changed and not just uh, from, you know, what neighbors are seeing. However, um, I also think that, um, you know, 40 kilometers per hour is safer than 60, is safer than 70 and so on. And I'm wondering what prevents us um, from deciding that in the areas that are, you know, are, are well defined, you know, you, they have to have a start and a stop. And, and like you said in your report that they need to have uh, clear entry and exit points to have these, you um, um, 40 kilometer zones applied to them, it, you know, what would prevent us from saying, you know, there are a lot of areas in our municipality where this would be appropriate, if there, that uh, 40 kilometers an hour would make sense and it would make that community safer and that the behavior needs to change as well, um, but that we couldn't just apply that and, you know, say that signs, there is a cost to them, but, you know, I, I think that there's, um, you know, why couldn't we just say that? Is there something that prevents us from making that kind of decision in order to move forward with things in a quicker manner and not just wait for the, the data? I hope that makes sense. So if I understand correctly, uh, you're asking why can we not just post the signs right now and just change them? Really signage is not uh, not a huge cost. Mm -hmm. uh, is that uh, what I'm hearing? Am I hearing that correctly? Uh, uh, th in essence, you know, if we wanted to say, you know, we've got an area that's clearly well defined, there's an entry, there's an exit, and uh, 40 kilometers an hour makes sense because it's a built up area. Why not just put up the signs and, and not have to have years worth of data to uh, to go back on? Yeah, I think that is uh, is definitely more applicable to the uh, the rural subdivisions. Many of them are already uh, posted at the entrance as a 40 kilometer an hour zone. Uh, as it stands right now, it's posted at the entrance and not with throughout. So it it technically is is 40 kilometers per hour at the entrance and changes to 50 once you're within the subdivision. So a lot of those areas would be very uh, very straightforward to implement. Uh, one one caution that I would uh, that I would give you is those those rural hamlets. Many of them with the county roads are are very uh, the significant amount of traffic is is going through. Uh, so if you have those uh, those local users that that do definitely go, uh, reduce their speeds to let's say 40 kilometers per hour and and someone else is also uh, plans to go through there at 80 you do see a lot more uh, rear end collisions um, 
and uh, so that that's one of the cautions that uh, that I would put uh, put forward. Um, one other item from the uh, from the signage perspective, there is we do need a bylaw to support each installation. Um, so obviously that would be a time where we would need to uh, come to council, and we would use that time to update council on how the program is uh, is is moving forward. Okay, so I suppose um, I understand what you're saying. Um, I suppose the driver behavior piece and the you know chance of you know collisions and so on. I mean, like the example of the sixty, the change down to sixty on Rideau River Road is a good example of that because we've seen accidents in that area um, with the speed reduction. Whether that was entirely the cause, but uh, you know, I I think that perhaps um, the point that I would make about that is that that's driver behavior that the data wouldn't necessarily make any difference, right? It wouldn't it wouldn't change that piece at all. Um, and if we were able to say there are clearly defined areas and they fit this, you know, what we're, what we're trying to accomplish that aren't already 40 kilometer an hour zones, um, you know, perhaps that that would be a way to, to move forward with those changes more expeditiously and support the, you know, the requests that we're getting from a lot of the different areas saying that, you know, something, you know, wanting to see something change. And again, that that's qualitative, um, but I'm, I'm just, um, I guess my question is, and it doesn't have to be answered tonight, is just what does the, time delay to collect all the data achieve that we can't uh, move forward on um, quicker sooner. Yeah. So I, one other uh, item that I will, uh, that I'll mention is uh, especially in the urban core and what we've seen is the the reduced speed limit, uh, it, it works in conjunction with traffic calming. So we do collect, when we collect data, what we're looking at um, moving forward is, uh, is traffic calming warranted and it will also gear us to which traffic calming measure may be applicable to uh, to facilitate the reduced speed. We want we don't want those people uh, driving 80 kilometers an hour in 40s to feel like they're being safe. We we would like the engineering and mm. the uh, the the measures installed to to. I'm going to use force people to slow down, but to feel like they should slow down to make sure that everybody is. Uh, is using the roadway properly and uh, as it was intended. Yeah, not just feel safe, but actually be safe. So that, that's yeah, a, that's a exactly. an important point. Um, okay, so the only other thing that I would like to add to this, and then I'll stop talking, is that uh, I think that uh, many of these changes do need to happen sooner than later. And I don't know how we Definitely. can, you know, put a, a timeline on this that is reasonable, understanding what the resources are and the constraints are within public works and so on. But uh, you know, I think uh, having a defined timeline to say we're going to move forward with this um uh you know i we won't have it done this summer obviously you know winter is coming you know there's all sorts of challenges with that but uh making sure that there's something in place prior to um you know sort of the next better driving season i guess uh you know the springtime that kind of thing i, I think would seem to me to be a, a time frame that hopefully would be uh acceptable by public works as well so i'm just throwing that out there i don't know how the rest of council feels about this uh, and how public works feels about that, but uh, just a thought on the table. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, Councillor Strachan, thank you. I just wanted to ask a, a question of clarity based upon what Mr. Bro was saying, and then I'll recognize Councillor Barkley and Councillor Sullivan who have their hands up. Um, Mr. Bro, based upon what you've said about rural subdivisions, um, right, in particular, uh, in, in terms of really quite simply needing a bylaw, right, I think to, I guess, enact, right, the speed limit of 40, where in some cases there's a posted speed limit at the entrance is what I understand that's 40, but then it reverts to 50 because we haven't, right, enacted the appropriate signage. If the data to Councilor Strachan's point isn't that helpful to us, and I'm not hearing that it necessarily is in those rural subdivisions in particular, um, could we ask this evening that Public Works prepare a set of bylaws that we could adopt in September, which would give you the capacity to reduce uh, speed limits in those subdivisions that, you know, Public Works deems as being appropriate for this exercise versus waiting for the outcome of a pilot that I don't understand from information you've shared this evening that really would change the outcome when we look at subdivisions. I accept hamlets are a different, right? They're a different kettle of fish. Um, is there any objection to, to going that route? And that way you'd be empowered, um, you know, to move uh, with some of those subdivisions that you could review and analyze and bring back in September? If I may jump in, 
uh, before. Yes, uh, of course, uh, Director Dunlop, go ahead. Ryan uh, answers. It's twofold. Now, Ryan has explained that the data will provide the assessment um, to make sure that we're in a keeping with uh, the traffic or the speed assessment policies, which are currently under review, as you're aware, as part of the four traffic policies. We only collect data typically in the summer and the better weather events, because that's typically when we have summer students. We're really far behind because we didn't last year. But absolutely, if council wishes to forego that, and they can request and direct of public works for specific areas to uh, to move forward with that uh, with that um, direction, with that request. If there's specific areas that you wish to move forward, um, but the data, the assessment tool that we have uh, is what we're predicating that evaluation from a scientific standpoint, from an engineering evaluation. Uh, I apologize. Um, I thought I was on mute, but I wasn't. So I'll, I'll go to Councillor Barkley and Councillor Sullivan, and I don't know if, if you want to give further sub consideration uh, you know, to the discussion this evening around whether or not we wait for data from rural subdivisions or not. I, I know I've heard enough from many residents within some of those subdivisions to suggest that uh, I think they would welcome, not, not necessarily everyone, I know there are speeders everywhere and they're often within neighborhoods, they don't come from outside, but certainly some of the feedback I've gotten suggests that there might be a logic to moving uh, more quickly, but I, I'll go uh, over to Councillor Barkley. Uh, well, I'd like just to follow up on what uh, Councillor Strapian and yourself uh, have mentioned. Uh, and, and referring to my previous comment about low hanging fruit, I think in the case of rural subdivisions where there's one at most two entry exit uh, areas that they and, and they don't uh, involve any county roads that uh, attaching at the entrance and the, the entrances uh, an area begins underneath the 40 kilometer uh, sign is is all that we need to do to uh, you know create that. So if it, if it's a bylaw for those rural subdivisions that are easy to do in the short term, um, I don't know if speed assessments are necessary in that case because um, they're 40 already. But in order to enforce it, I, I guess it's an enforcement issue um, that once once that bylaw happens and maybe. Karen can help me out here, but I'm inclined to, to ask Public Works to come back with, uh, you know, bylaws prepared for rural subdivisions uh, adopting the signage, uh, gateway signage program. But uh, I'd like to hear from Karen on that. Director Dunlop, is there anything further? Um, just uh, the rural subdivisions that are not posted are 50. There are some subdivisions that are 50. There are some subdivisions that are 40 at the entrances. So there is a mixed. So as part of a report back, we could provide you a list of the rural subdivisions, uh, the number of entrance ways, whether or not they can be compatible from a gateway standpoint. And um, so how many 40s, how many 50s, and how many subdivisions we have, and which would be compatible from gateway um, without the assessment data, if that is uh, the direction that we receive from council. I think that's the kind of direction that we're looking for. Exactly. You know, let's do an assessment of where it's appropriate and, and have a list that we can maybe in September or October, um, you know, enact the bylaws, the relevant bylaws to, to get that signage up. Okay. Do you want to formalize? Does anyone sure. want to formalize that in a motion so Karen has appropriate direction? Sure. Uh, the council directs staff to compile a list of rural subdivisions in which the gateway signage program would be appropriate and to bring uh, the relevant bylaws to council uh, so that we can enact and, well, I guess that's all I need to, I think and that covers in, it. Yeah. In September, Council Barkley? Uh, September, uh, I'll, okay. yeah. Director sure. Dunlop, is, is that achievable? And I'll look to Councillor Strucker again, she got the ball rolling on this. Councillor Strucker again, does that reflect the intent of some of your interventions? It does, thank you. Okay, would you like to second? I will second it. Thank you. Okay. So that motion is on the table. Uh, Director John Love, is there anything to add? Is September doable? I have nothing further uh, based on that direction. No. Okay. And is September is doable based on the reduced uh, evaluation that would be required right. from an engineering standpoint. So all other aspects of Mr. Bro's report remain though, in terms of the assessment of rural hamlets, where we know there's some, we'll say trouble spots, if you will, 
Um, so the, the rest of the data collection and analysis for pilot uh, remains in play. Is that correct? Mr. Bro, can you confirm that? Uh, I believe that's what I'm hearing that, uh, that we would get direction for the rural subdivisions uh, mm -hmm. once we have prepared that list and, uh, right. and what the existing speed limits are. And then we would, we would still move forward with the, uh, the rural hamlets uh, as we normally would uh, the, the initial consultations with the County that, and data collection, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, I, I'm not sure that the uh, data collection, we'd have to uh, um, look at resources to see if we would be prepared to uh, establish conclusions for those rural hamlets at the September meeting, mm -hmm. but that can, that can be investigated for sure. Okay. Okay, good stuff. Uh, so Councilor Barkley, Councilor Strachan, you've uh, moved and seconded that motion. I'll just uh, look on my Zoom screen. Uh, I see Councillor Sullivan uh, wanting to make a comment. And Councillor Barkley, do you have something else to add? No. Okay. Councillor Sullivan, any, anything for you? Thank you. Uh, and thank you to Councillor Stracker, Yan, and Barkley for uh, moving this forward uh, this evening. Um, I think it's really important because we continue to get complaints about people speeding in residential areas. I think it's also important that, and perhaps uh, Mayor. Peckford and uh, Councillor Barkley could take this to the Police Services Board as well, because I think that uh, the enforcement and the police presence is a, a really big factor as well in how well the gateway signage is effective. Like if you look at Somerville Road, it hasn't changed according to this uh, pre and post and the current speed. It's, it's still like 70 to 75, which is 30 to 35 over the speed limit. So uh, Somerville Road is a, is a big issue. And I also think that uh, Bridge Street and Van Buren are, are problematic as well. Um, people just rock it up Bridge Street sometimes. Um, so I think I, I can say from experience when we did have police presence on Wellington Road back in Oh, I honestly can't remember when it was, but um, they did issue a few speeding tickets and I think they issued a few warnings, but just having that police vehicle on the road made a big difference. And uh, I think that would be effective all around town if they randomly moved around. So um, I think that's something that if we enforce it, people will get the message and uh, maybe it's, we, we did say that we'd give a bit of a, a lenient period from the time that it was introduced with the gateway speed, but I think it's time maybe to get a little, little firmer with it, with the enforcement, and maybe that's something that you could take to the police services board, because I think it's effective. Um, the second question point I'd like to make is I'm just wondering when the road safety policies will be brought to council. I, um, I thought I remember August, but we're not meeting in August. And uh, so I, I'm just uh, curious for perhaps uh, Mr. Bro or uh, Director Dunlop could give me an idea when that's going to be, uh, when they're gonna come forward, particularly. Sure. The for sure. Roots. I would uh, oh, just, uh, Mr. Bro, before we go down that path, we've got a motion on the table and I'd actually like to call the question. I don't think Councillor O'Sullivan's uh, question is that relevant to the uh, motion. So I, I would just like to call the question on the a motion. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, thank you, Councillor O'Sullivan, for your intervention around uh, enforcement. I think uh, certainly Councillor Barkley and I, who sit on the police services board, as well as Deb Wilson, are, are certainly, uh, what do we say, uh, beating that drum over and over and over, and hopefully we'll get some more community policing on our uh, municipal roads and county roads. So I'll call the question, colleagues, all in favor of the motion as moved and seconded. Good, thank you. Okay, so that's done, thanks. And then uh, Mr. Rowe, please uh, answer the question. So I believe that uh, the plan was for August. Uh, Understanding that uh, council is not meeting in August, we we do anticipate that coming in uh, in September. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, I just have a quick question for Mr. Bro. It's around your comments about traffic calming, right? Uh, and and the applicability and the utility, if you will, and efficacy, uh, if I might use that word, of uh, the the urban signage program. 
I, I know you speak of traffic coming and I know on Pine Hill, I think we're awaiting a, a sign right in the middle of the road uh, to hopefully deter some amount of speeding um, or at least to provide a visual cue to slow down. Can you speak of other traffic coming measures? You say that they're critical, right, to the efficacy of um, lower speeds. I, I know that we are absolutely developing that po policy around traffic coming and what makes sense, but I haven't seen a lot in play, right, as part and parcel of traffic coming. Is there anything that you can put on the table or is that September's discussion about, well, what, what can we deploy when it comes to traffic coming? Because I think our, our tools have been pretty limited up to now. Yeah, and I think uh, I think that definitely works into the uh, the discussion in September. Uh, we have been completing our regular assessments from a traffic calming perspective, as well as testing the speed limit policy, the truck routes policy, um, through our regular assessments. So there have been recommendations that uh, will be provided uh, through that. And once once we can say that the the traffic calming policy is is approved by council, we will have that list included in that report so that we can say. Uh, these are the areas that we do recommend traffic calming. So it's almost a, um, an immediate action once that, uh, that tra traffic calming policy is approved that we can go ahead and uh, prioritize those recommended uh, measures. And do we, have, do we run out of time this fall to implement the traffic calming measures if the report is only coming back in September? I understand we can't deal with it tonight, but what are the timing implications? So there are some items that, uh, that would fall under, uh, um, fall, fall under the grouping that can be established this year. Uh, there are some items uh, that may require budget allotments or budget considerations for next year. Uh, there, there is a, a mixed bag there that, uh, that definitely we want to implement the measures that we can, uh, the priorities uh, this year. And I, I don't think September would be too late for that. Um, uh, obviously, there's some uh, man manufacturing and ordering that type of processes that would have to come into play. But uh, definitely, I think it's reasonable to say that uh, should that traffic calming policy be uh, be approved by council, then there would be uh, further implementations this year. Great, that's good to hear. I see Deputy Mayor. Deputy Mayor, hand up. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, Mr. Rowe, um, question on, since we're talking about the calming issues, uh, I often travel down Concession Road and we've got some uh, signs in the middle of the road there. Most of them look like they've got the hell beat out of them. Um, I don't find them very visual when I'm coming either way, actually, because they're kind of white and not very fluorescent. Are we looking at a different particular sign? I know in Ottawa, I see some much brighter yellow type signs that stand out much more visually. So I'm assuming people don't see them. That's why they're running over them. So if they're not seeing them and running over them, well, they're not slowing down probably either. Um, so I'm just wondering if you're looking at a different type of sign or something more effective, maybe. Yes, there are definitely uh, different signs uh, available that we, we can purchase. Uh, and that that's definitely one of the uh, one of the considerations moving forward um, uh, with with any other implementations, because we, we definitely have uh, we have noted that current ones are getting very, uh, um, very used, let's say. Um, so we uh, definitely are considering that moving forward. I think it's a great question because obviously they're they're very, despite not being seen, they're one of the only locations in our municipality, right, with those in play. And the Ottawa citizen in Ottawa, city of Ottawa, did a, a, a detailed, comprehensive article on the use of more flexible barriers that, in fact, endure <laughs> uh, the minor hits, right, that vehicles uh, may encounter uh, if they're not adhering or watching. And the whole point of traffic calming is to slow people down. So, Mr. Bro, we I think we all encourage you to take a really okay. close look at some of the evolving technology, if you will, when it comes to those things. I do see Director Dunlop wanting to add. Um, thank you very much, Your Worship. In regards to concession specific, those signs, it's actually a complaint that was brought to the Agricultural Committee, the Advisory Committee, that those specific type of signs and the location that they are placed with their large equipment have caused them grief. Um, so the majority of the damage that have occurred to those signs are actually getting caught on things like combines and rear pull behind tractor equipment. Um, so we're, we are going to have to consider different equipment as well as consideration where they're placed. The agricultural community say if they're done near a ditch, 
they can go around them with their ditch, but if they're done by a sidewalk and a curb, they can't. Yep, yeah, that's a great point. And uh, Council Barkley and I sit on the Agricultural Rural Affairs Committee and you're right to bring that up, Director Dunlop. Hopefully both the technology and the placement, right, will have to be uh, reconsidered or um, moving forward, uh, considered as part of the um, inclusion. And I, I know, I'm just gonna mention Pine Hill because I know Pine Hill residents may be watching. I understand that there was supposed to be a traffic calming measure coming to Pine Hill um, this summer. Is that still the case? We have received specific delineators for Pine Hill. We're not satisfied with the quality of the products. We're looking at our options, but yes, that is the plan. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, had lots of discussion here. Um, Ms. Babcock Cormier is advising uh, that we should also look at the consideration of uh, the recommendation, which I believe remains relevant, and that is that council receive the report title gateway signage update for information purposes, as well as direct staff to evaluate whether the gateway and speed reduction programs are suitable to be implemented. Of course, we now have a, a motion specifically around rural, relevant rural subdivisions. So Ms. Babka Cormier, is that second part of the motion still germane? Uh, so it would be with respect to you, um, Hamlets and subdivisions. So Director Dunlop was the intent that subdivisions would be both rural subdivisions and subdivisions that are not rural. Um, the urban subdivisions have already been incorporated into the current gateway program. So Thank it would you. be rural subdivisions, so it can be removed if, uh, if wished. Thank you. So really the effort around data analysis and piloting then really becomes about the Hamlets. Is, is that correct, Director Alamo? We're not taking anything away from the value of your report. We're just expediting rural subdivisions or relevant rural subdivisions. Yes. Uh, certainly if there are subdivisions that you don't think qualify for a gateway signage program, we would still want you to investigate those. So maybe we can just say uh, relevant subdivisions, right? That are not covered by the other motion. Ms. Babcock, me, I'm sure you can figure out a way to finesse that. Yes. All right. Uh, can I have a mover and a seconder, please? I have Council Barkley and Council Strachan in this instance. Thank you. And I apologize. I know I just see hands, so I'm not sure I'm being equitable in terms of moving and seconding this evening. Council Sullivan, I'll go to you for the next one. Um, I'll, uh, I'll call the question. All in favor, please. Thank you. I do want you all to feel equally valued, colleagues. Uh, all right, so we'll move on. I think we're nearing the end here. Uh, 825, uh, nothing under Parks, Rec, and Culture this evening or Emergency and Protective Services. So I believe um, we do have a, a quick update on the strategic plan survey, and I believe Ms. Janu is here uh, to ensure, certainly, Council, all of you are aware of the next steps on the community strategic planning process, which has been very much underway. I, I understand, and I think most of you are aware that um, most municipal advisory committee chairs have been interviewed by representatives from Strategy Corp and Ms. Janu has been attending a variety of different meetings of advisory committees and I think some stakeholder groups and maybe Ms. Janu you can speak to that. Uh, but of course, a, a critical next step is really the um, survey. So go ahead, Ms. Janu. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, so as you mentioned, the um, consultant Strategy Corp have met with all of the chairs at this point for the advisory committee meetings, as well as a number of other community leaders from community groups. Um, and all the interviews went well and helped inform actually the survey that'll be coming forth. They've also uh, been meeting with senior management team as well. And of course they've met with you individually as counselors. So we're very excited to announce that the strategic plan community survey will be launched tomorrow. So keep an eye out for that. The link will be uh, put out there through a media release and on our social media and the website. Um, to the points earlier in the meeting, there will be accessible hard copies available at the Municipal Centre and the library as well. And we'll be out in the community to solicit people to take part in the survey as well. So very exciting to launch this stage. Great, uh, thank you very much. Any questions or comments, colleagues? Um, can someone, uh, Ms. Janu, how long will this survey be in the field? I know I had that question as I was reviewing the media release. So the plan is at this time to have it open for three weeks. 
And that would bring us to what date? So three weeks from today would be August 10th. Or sorry, it will be tomorrow, so August 11th. Okay. Uh, of course, with the long weekend in there and people starting to feel like they can go on holidays, I think we wanna make sure that we get good uptake here. Uh, Councilor Barkley? And I'll, I see Councilor Yeah. Um, given that it's the, what I call the summer doldrums, is there any consideration? I, I don't know what uh, the final date that we're working uh, to and how to back that up in terms of assessing the data that we collect. But it seems to me that uh, uh, from my own personal experience, you know, the middle of July to the middle of August, it, it, there's very few people around or at least focusing on things like surveys. So I, I wonder if we couldn't have a, long, a bit of a, a longer um, period for people to complete those surveys. I think it's important that you know, people uh, know about it, know why it's important through our communication, but also have sufficient time to uh, fill it out. So um, th that's my question. Are, are we working towards a, a final date where we're bringing this to the community and, and then ultimately comes to council? And, it, and is that a hard date? which means that we have to compress this consultation period or can we extend it a little bit? Through you, your worship, um, we do have some flexibility for sure. The consultants plan built in plenty of time for any adjustments. So we can definitely talk to them about adjusting specifically the survey uh, period length that it's open. Um, and the nice part about that too is the next stage will be the town halls, which can happen concurrently to the survey. So it's not like it pushes back kind of our next stage. Um, so, uh, I don't know if you can put a figure to it. So can we double the survey period from three to six without compressing and stealing time away from any of the other steps in the process? I would have to talk to the consultants about exact period length that we could lengthen it without pushing anything back. Uh, we have a meeting with them tomorrow and could definitely bring it up. Um, and again, the nice thing about you know, just adjusting a survey timeline, it doesn't necessarily, um, might not affect the work plan or budget in the sense that it doesn't require more time on their part, which is generally what affects um, our work plans and budgets. Okay, um, thank you. I'll go to uh, Councillor Strachan. Uh, thank you, Mr. No. Uh, what, uh, what's the date of the town hall? Um, we haven't set the two dates yet. That is part of our meeting mm -hmm. tomorrow. Okay, so the dates aren't set. I, I mean, I think that, uh, yeah, it's the summer doldrums and it's usually a hard time. We're not really great at getting a lot of survey responses as we talked about at the top of this meeting. Um, and I would say that uh, I think, especially as things are opening up, there's more and more people who are taking time to just completely unplug, get away um, and uh, you know try and uh, remove themselves from what they've been forced to be around for a year and a half. So um, I think that uh, extending the time and even trying to get into that window of when everybody's getting back to their regularly scheduled programming of September would probably be useful as well. So um, I, I, I appreciate that, you know, three weeks is a reasonable time. Six weeks, though, still keeps us in August and may not be, um, may not have this uh, the awareness and increased uh, understanding of you know what what's being asked of folks as well as they're still in you know sort of summer mode as well. So um, I would ask that if we could extend it into September without creating too much delays, that I think that that would be uh, potentially useful and um, perhaps even overlapping with the town hall might produce um, sort of another layer of uh, folks interested and engaged in in um, getting in on the survey if they haven't already. Anyway, that's uh, if it, I don't know what uh, limits there are, but uh, that's what uh, I'm thinking as well. And Mr. Dyke. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Yeah. So the schedule for the for the program is council's discretion. They can they can adjust the rate. Just one thing I will caution with: the lengthening survey time doesn't necessarily correspond into more participation. Um, three to six, six weeks is an awful long time for a survey to be out there. So we're gonna have to make sure we modify the communications to ensure that it stays relevant over the whole course of the six weeks, which is not an issue. We'll, we'll discuss that with the consultant tomorrow. With respect to overlapping the, the open houses with the survey, um, that would modify program a little bit because the point of, one of the points as we set up now is the, the results of the survey are taken into the open houses. 
Um, so there would be some modification on that as well. Not insurmountable by any stretch of the imagination, but there would maybe some modification. So Hillary and I can take back that information. We are meeting with the consultant tomorrow and discuss those kind of nuances and modifications. And then we can massage the program to meet what council's desires are as expressed tonight would be. Okay, Councilor Strachan, is there anything else? Yeah, I agree with uh, Mr. Dyke. I think that, uh, you know, the length of time doesn't necessarily get you better results, but the timing of that is, and I think it's, you know, it's already in place. So I think, you know, we, um, the only option, I guess, that we would have is to to lengthen it, to get into the right window, to encourage people to be more, you know, aware as they're tuned into, you know, their regular life. Um, and I, I mean, I guess it's probably obvious, um, but I'll say it anyway, town halls will have to happen well into September. Um, people need to get their lives back in order, have to be done vacations back home, have their kids back in school and be ready to be able to focus on that kind of thing before uh before we start bringing a town hall in uh in as well so i i again i know that you're you're still talking about when those uh um, open houses or town halls will take place but i think that that's a, an important consideration so thank you thank you council Stragan. i see deputy mayor thank you madam uh yeah i concur with everybody's saying and gary i concur with what you're saying too uh, about the length of surveys i do lots of surveying so um but um i i can the this period though is definitely a period of low response to any surveys that, that, that i've seen in the past so uh, by extending and as you said um the messaging has to be you, you need to change your messaging that you make sure that you're kind of keeping it at top of the mind as we as we go it's going to take it's going to take a push um, but definitely extending it, you would in normal period, I wouldn't extend because it wouldn't make sense. But for this, because we're into the these particular four weeks of uh, of uh, summer are definitely low points for people. And uh, COVID's so letting letting us open things up now. Uh, everybody's scattering, I think, as much as they can. So I think it's I think I, I concur with everybody saying. Okay, uh, excellent. And maybe uh, Ms. Janu or. Mr. Dite, you can answer the question of when, obviously, timelines notwithstanding, and we're clearly uh, extending the process, it appears, or at least uh, giving people a little more opportunity. What, what is the intention to bring a, a draft plan uh, either to council or, I, again, I, I don't understand all the steps. I don't have the benefit of all the steps yet. Maybe, Ms. Janu, you can speak to that. Yeah, so the original plan was to bring a draft in and around October, uh, November. Um, and then the final draft to council in January. And I think our hope is that can still be accommodated, but we understand if there has to be some shifts. Okay. Good. Thanks. Uh, anything else, colleagues on this? I, I, I just wanted you to be aware that it's happening because I know we are big communicators ourselves and it's important that uh, we also encourage people to fill up the survey because if they don't and uh, they don't like what's in the draft plan, they'll be coming to us and asking where was that survey. So it would be very helpful for council colleagues to make sure that they spread the news far and wide. And if people don't get to it for a couple of weeks, then there'll be time for them to uh, fill it out when they get back. I, I don't believe Ms. Janu, this survey is that long from what I understand. No, I went through it today. It took me seven minutes. Okay. And mobile friendly devices, of course, I would, it is suitable for all platforms. Yes, absolutely. And lots of, uh, I say seven minutes, there's lots of open ended questions. So it depends on how long you take to answer those, I guess. Okay, thank you. I and, think I, I'm sorry, Councillor Sullivan, do you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah, I just wondered, uh, Hillary, is it possible that we could uh, see the survey? Um, and have a look at is it is it a hard fast survey done now? Or is there any option for input? Or can we have a look at it? Look at it? In order for the press release to go out tomorrow, it, it's finalized in its current form, but we can definitely share the link tonight if you'd like. Yeah, that would be nice. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Okay, anything else on that? We're nearing the end of our meeting. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Barkley, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to emphasize to the community how important this process mm -hmm. is. Uh, because what this, the community strategic plan is basically surveying the community about what kind of community they want to live in in, in five, ten years from now. So uh, it's very broad ranging, but it's very important that we get as much public feedback as possible to get the, uh, the most robust plan of community strategic plan that'll take us forward for the next five years at least. Yeah. So uh, it's very important. So. Uh, besides extending the, the length of the time that they have 
to fill out the survey, I, I strongly encourage people to get, get involved and take seven minutes to determine where we're going for the next five years. For sure, it's a big deal. I remember being tangentially involved as just a, an average resident in one forum uh, back in, I guess, 12, 13, uh, when that community strategic planning exercise took place. And I, I was concerned about the limited numbers of people who were participating at that time. So I know there's lots of uh, touch points and pain points and opinions in this community about what the future looks like. So uh, it'll be great to get a diversity of views and perspectives and try to put it all together. Okay. Uh, so with that in mind, um, I will uh, move on, colleagues. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're nearing the end. I have given you no break, um, but I think we're uh, now at the point where uh, we would be accepting any uh, questions from members of the media or our community. I see both Hillary and Rachel here this evening. So I'll just direct uh, um, any, uh, or invite you to ask any questions, should you have them, and Ms. Backpark Premier, I also look to you for any questions that would have been submitted by email. If, if you uh, don't mind, Madam Mayor, I'd like to interrupt. I have a notice of motion. Oh, right. I, I is, apologize. Yeah, Indeed, okay. I really apologize, uh, Councilor. No, it's, it's fine. I uh, I'm, could be a Freudian slip. I, I don't know. Breathing <laughs> by there. Um, I think I did that to Councilor Strachan two weeks ago as well, or a, a month ago. So I will okay. become more disciplined when it comes to notices of motion. So back to section N. Uh, yeah. Council Barkley, proceed. So uh, uh, I'm just bringing notice of a motion uh, to reconsider a previous resolution that we made last week. Um, and uh, that I guess that motion will be heard at the next uh, council meeting. So there won't be a lot of discussion and I will just dial it up. I'll read the motion that I would like council to reconsider and then look for, I guess, someone to second uh, my notice. So the resolution I'm referring to uh, reads as follows, that council authorized the mayor and clerk to sign the site plan agreement for 5,870 5, County Road 19, subject to further review by the municipal councilor and, subject, and subject to the removal of the requirement for Kevlar developments to improve the connecting link to the adjacent subdivision of Forest Creek. So I would like to bring that back to council for reconsideration at the next council meeting. So thank you, Council Barkley. And I know that um, I asked Ms. Babcock Cormier how to handle a notice of motion in this instance. Um, Ms. Babcock Cormier, what's required here? So Council Barkley has moved the motion. What's required is a second. Um, mm -hmm. And then it needs to, or sorry, approval of three fifths of council. Okay. To go forward. Okay. So is there a seconder for that motion? Okay, so Councillor Sullivan, um, is there a want to discuss this further? Of course, uh, Councillor Barkley and Deputy Mayor and I contended with this issue last week and uh, came to a, a different conclusion by a two to one vote. Um, totally under, I totally recognize Councillor Barkley's want for uh, reconsideration. Is there anything more to add before I call the question? Well, um, just in support of my notice, I, I just felt that last week we didn't go far enough um, re regarding the pathway. Um, and for me, it's more than just what kind of pathway connects these two communities or future communities. Um, it, it's more about what kind of community we want in the future. I think it's fundamental and I'm not trying to uh, you know, to turn, you know, over overemphasize it. But for me, it's it's very important that that we take a stand about what kind of community we want to build. And I think this, how we deal with this pathway, is represents how we want to move forward. So, um, that's that's my piece. Mr. Dyke, did you want to get in there? I'm sorry, I didn't wasn't sure. No, just from a process standpoint, your worship, and, and, and it was it was it was fine. Just the debate tonight is just about whether or not council is willing to reconsider, not to discuss the merits of the reconsideration mm -hmm. at the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay, I will say for the record, in terms of the notice of motion to reconsider, um, Council Barkley, I totally hear where you're coming from, and we are often on the same page. But I I will not support the notice of motion to reconsider this evening. I do think there was a protracted 
uh, debate last week. And while I absolutely support connectivity in almost every way possible, I think when you have a neighborhood struggling to come to terms with uh, a major, a major development uh, right next door, if, if they're not ready for it now, I'm, I'm willing to wait and, and have that discussion when the neighborhood is comfortable. That being said, I understand there are people in that neighborhood who would like to see that connectivity. So it's a very divided and divisive issue. I don't have the appetite, however, to, to reconsider and not just put that on the table when we're talking about, uh, you know, making a decision about that this evening. But completely respect where you're coming from, uh, but it, I, I, don't, I, I don't share the appetite for the uh, reconsideration. But that being said, I'll look for any other comments before calling the vote. Councillor Strachan, go ahead. Uh, so last week when the uh, uh, last part of the discussion took place, I was unable to attend the meeting and um, I appreciate what uh, Councillor Barkley has brought forward and uh, to allow for all of us to participate in the conversation. And I won't speak for uh, Councillor Sullivan, However, when I realized I could not make the meeting, I did not ask for the discussion to be deferred. And I also assumed that uh, with quorum and three uh, members of council being present, uh, that the decision would be made whether or not I agreed with the final decision. Um, and so uh, I, I find it a bit challenging because I would like to weigh in um, and uh, have my say uh, as to what uh, I feel is appropriate or not. And at the same time, um, I also believe that there's a process that takes place and that we need to be able to stand on, you know, what decisions are made uh, by the rest of council at the same time. Um, so unfortunately, I think I cannot support this um, notice of motion either um, because uh, simply because I did defer and it wasn't by proxy vote, but I did defer the decision to the members of council who were present uh, during the, uh, the discussion last week. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I'd, I'd ask for the vote to be recorded then. For sure. Uh, I see no further comment. Uh, so I'll have Ms. Babcock. I, I'm correct about that. No one else is wanting to get in here. Is that correct? Okay. So then I'll ask Ms. Babcock, Babcock Cormier to please record the vote. Call the recorded vote. Thank you, Your Worship. So. Uh, are you sorry my apologies are you going to call the vote your worship and I'll I am calling the vote thank and you I'm asking you to yes. ask a member of council for their vote thank you very much thank you council Barkley uh I'm in favor of reopening the discussion thank you deputy mayor Jim McManaman not in favor thank you Councillor O'Sullivan I'm in favor thank you mayor Peckford not in favor thank you and Councillor Strachan? I am not in favor. Thank you. That's three votes not in favor, two votes in favor. Three out of three votes of five were required, or sorry, required. So the motion did not pass. Uh, thank you, Councillor Barkley, uh, for your efforts this evening and bringing this to the fore. I uh, certainly appreciate your thought and consideration, but here we are. All right. So I'll ask. Any other members of council? Is there any other notice of motion that we need to be aware of? I'm not seeing any. Uh, so then I will move on and I will uh, go through the agenda as presented, introduction and consideration of bylaws. I believe Ms. Babcock Cormier, we have dealt with all the relevant bylaws. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Worship. Okay, so then uh, we'll go back to uh, section P, period for questions from the public and media. Uh, members of our community, of course, or members of the media. And uh, once again, I recognize, oh, I, was, it's, I mix up our two Hillary's. I think Hillary, I referred to you mistakenly. We've got Rachel here. Uh, Rachel Everett Fry is uh, here from the media. And I see your Kojiko, your TV Kojiko, but I think they're just recording. Any uh, questions from the media this evening? Well, Not from I, me. Thank you, guys. Okay, thank you, Rachel. And Rachel, of course, is replacing the other Hillary, uh, Hillary Thompson, uh, who is uh, on a mat leave or soon to be on a mat leave, but has taken leave from the North Granville Times. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Ms. Babcock Cormier, can you confirm that you have received no inquiries uh, by email from members of our community or members of the media? I confirm that I've received no inquiries or questions from the public or members of the media. Okay, so I'm assuming. Um, there is no one here then that uh, wants to ask a question. I've done one call. 
and I don't see anyone moving to unmute. Uh, thank you, Rachel, for chiming in there briefly. So then we'll go to a close of the meeting. Uh, I'll look to Ms. Babcock Cormier to read the confirmation bylaw. Yes, Your Worship. That bylaw 76 21 to confirm the proceedings of council at its regular meeting held on July 20th, 2021, be adopted and passed. All right, I'll look for a mover and a seconder. Councillor Sullivan, <laughs> welcome. And Councillor Strachan. Uh, you've moved and seconded. I'll call the question all in favor. Good. Uh, and a uh, motion to adjourn. Uh, Councillor Sullivan, do you want to take that one too? And I'll look for a seconder among my male colleagues, Deputy Mayor. Okay, we are motioning to adjourn at 8 48 uh, p.m. I'll call the question on adjournment. All in favor? Good. All right, stay safe, colleagues. Thank you very much to all staff who've joined on another hot summer evening. Hope you get your vaccinations and a bit of holiday time. Thank you to Burkett and team for uh, their presentation. Take care, everyone. Safe travel, everyone. See you in Thank September. You.